Hello and welcome back. This week we look at the birth of modernity. Hello and welcome back. This week we look at the birth of modernity, the birth of modern political, uh, economic, social and cultural structures that determine the world that we live in today. These modern trends emerge thanks to developments in the sciences that uh, parted from the new belief that through observation and empirical analysis human beings could come to understand and maybe even improve the natural world that surrounded them. This same analytical approach came to be applied to the study and understanding of politics, uh, economics, and society. This process inspired new conceptions of the relationship between government and society, between church and society, between the individual and the authority structures that shape the individual's life. Starting in the 18th century then, we will see the emergence of modern concepts of individual rights, representative government, secular society, that is the separation of church and state, all of them coming together at the end of the 18th century to inspire political and social revolutions that change radically the structure of government and society in North America, France, and most of Latin America. So this week we will start by tracing the origins of these ideas and then explore the radical political shifts they inspired. I wanted to start by giving you some general guidelines that will hopefully help you to differentiate between traditional and modern society. Um, the cultures and societies that we've looked at so far this semester would, ha would tend to fall within the traditional model. And what we will look at from now on will be either within the modern society model or um, will find itself caught somewhere between traditional and modern. So let's start by looking at the concept of work. In traditional society, work would be done using human or animal power. In modern society, machines start to do the work. Government. Uh, in traditional society, we tend to see absolute rulers. And uh, we've described the, the Spanish and the Portuguese empires. We've also looked at the Muslim empires. All of these would have some variation of this absolutist control from a single ruler. In modern society, we're going to start to see the move towards governments controlled by the people. Representative governments in which politicians depend on being re-elected through popular elections to remain in office. Traditional society was characterized by privilege for a select few, whereas in modern society we see an insistence on equal rights for all, uh, the belief that uh, there is a, an innate equality that exists in society across social and political boundaries. Because of the privilege that government and church enjoyed in traditional society, access at, to knowledge and conclusions that uh, were reached regarding the important questions of the day were dominated by these two institutions. In modern society, on the other hand, um, knowledge is, at least in theory, open to all. And then there's the last big difference that I wanted to point out. Uh, change, the concept of change, then the attitude that uh, would be typical in these two different uh, types of society. In traditional society, change is seen as something negative. It, it, in a sense, violates the sacred customs that have been established by the privileged uh, authority groups, most typically the government and the church. In modern society, change is actually welcomed as progress. And this is something that you're really going to be noticing in today's lecture um, as we look at the development of modern society. Also, you can uh, notice it in your, in your own experiences, probably, um, outside of class and your personal lives that the concept of progress is a very positive concept. Uh, the idea that we're moving forward and that tomorrow will always be better than today. That uh, tomorrow brings an improvement over the present. The philosophical movement that we're really concerned with today is the Enlightenment. But we cannot explain the Enlightenment without first looking at the scientific revolution, which uh, predates it, and which heavily influenced the abstract notions that led to the Enlightenment. The scientific revolution is not a specific event, but rather a trend in the sciences that um, draws out over a three or four hundred year period in which we see a number of very important discoveries being made that lead to a new and radically different conception of 
the Earth and its place in the universe. One of the first of these discoveries would have to be Copernicus's development of the heliocentric theory in 1543. Copernicus challenged the traditionally accepted notion that the Earth was at the center of the universe and that all planets and the Sun revolved around the Earth. This belief was largely founded in religion. Parting from the notion that humans were God's chosen people, it seemed logical to dominant religious authorities that uh, the Earth should be at the center of the universe, God's universe. And after spending many years observing the Sun and the stars move across the sky, uh, Copernicus will actually conclude that it is not in fact the Earth that is at the center of the universe, but rather the Sun, and that the Earth actually revolves around the Sun. Unfortunately, Copernicus's findings, though based on observation and radical reasoning, were rejected by the Church because it challenged their belief in God's sovereignty over the universe. Copernicus's findings were confirmed a few years later by Galileo Galilei. Galileo took a telescope an instrument used mainly for military purposes, and used it to observe the stars and the moon at night. He verified Copernicus's calculations that supported his uh, heliocentric theory. But rather than be applauded for his scientific achievement, Galileo was actually placed under house arrest by order of the Pope, the uh, head of the Catholic Church, in 1633, and was not released until he recanted his views meaning that he publicly denounced his own views as being untruthful. Church officials obviously felt threatened and were worried that uh, scientific research would uh, replace the Bible as a source of knowledge. But scientific discoveries continued to appear throughout the 17th century. The most famous are probably those of Isaac Newton. He developed the uh, law of gravity and uh, different laws of physics, including the law of inertia, starting in 1687. His biggest achievement would be to bring together all physical laws and demonstrate their mathematical truth. In other words, uh, he was one of the first of the modern scientists to apply mathematical formulation to the interpretation of physical law. This allowed him to calculate, but predict, the results of physical movement and force. The implications of this were tremendous. The mechanical function of the universe was no longer a mystery, monopolized by God. Human reason and analytical ability could be used to understand it, to discover the truth about the world that humans lived in. The great discoveries of the scientific revolution had been based on the use of rational analysis. To this day, scientists use the scientific method, uh, the establishment of a hypothesis, uh, the checking of that hypothesis through observation and the reasoning and the reaching of a conclusion that will establish a scientific theory that Newton, Copernicus, and Galileo had first established uh, over 400 years ago. The realization that humans through observation could determine the laws of nature led to a new belief in progress. The belief that if natural laws could be discovered, so could social laws. Uh, rational analysis could be used to better understand human behavior and the social and governmental institutions that humans had created. This uh, analysis could lead to improvements in um, human behavior and institutions and thereby would lead to the progress of humanity, the improvement of humanity in the future. The philosophical movement that came to be known as the Enlightenment was fathered by a man named John Locke, and uh, you see an image of him here. Locke became a big advocate of social equality and challenged the uh, deeply enrooted notion in traditional society that um, privilege was a birthright, that kings and queens had the right to rule by birthright. Um, he wrote a book called The Essay Concerning Human Understanding in 1690. In it, he argued that humans were born equal, in the sense that they were born equally unknowing. They were, in his words, a tabula rasa, or a blank slate, meaning that they were empty of any knowledge, and that that knowledge was filled as one became educated. This led him to conclude that knowledge was dependent on social privilege. Only those that were rich or politically powerful had access to education. Those that did not, did not learn how to read and write and were left at the mercy of those that could. 
This, John Locke argued, was the real source of power, the real source of privilege that royalty and the church had maintained over their subjects. Parting from the notion that we were all equal, John Locke went on to argue that all human beings enjoyed the same natural rights. These three basic natural rights, he pointed out, were life, liberty, and the right to own property. From here, John Locke would go on to challenge uh, authoritarian styles of government, uh, absolutist governments, where all power lay in the hands of one or two individuals, the king, the queen, royalty, the church, which were typically characterized by a complete disregard for the people's interests, and instead argue that government's role was primarily defending the people's rights. If the government failed to defend these rights, and thereby broke what John Locke called the social contract between the people and the government that represented them, then the people had the right to actually rise up against the government and replace it with another one that would better defend their rights. John Locke was joined by a number of other thinkers, a number of other philosophers that came to be referred to as the philosophes of the Enlightenment. One of these more prominent philosophers was the Baron de Montesquieu, an actual uh, baron in France. Uh, who wrote a book called The Spirit of Laws in 1748. In it, he developed an idea uh, initially proposed by John Locke that uh, for government to be just and to appropriately represent uh, the people that it ruled over, it uh, should be separated into different branches. Government would be divided into three areas, three branches, legislative, executive, and judicial each one of these taking care of different um, functions within government. The legislative creating laws, the executive enforcing them, and the judicial making sure that those laws were constitutional and that they best represented the people's interests. This ensured, at least in theory, that none of the individual branches would become more powerful than the other. Montesquieu also recognized that this type of representative government would necessarily lead to the elimination of privileged positions such as that of the king. Without a king, kingdoms would have no central identifying factor. In traditional society, kings ruled over their land. Uh, individuals that lived on that land were subjects of the king. That was their identity. They were, for example, members of the French kingdom and uh, thereby were subjects of the French king. Without kings, uh, an alternate form of identity would have to be developed. And Montesquieu proposed the creation of what he called a national identity. Members of the same nation had a shared history, shared culture, shared language. These characteristics would become the basis of the new national identity and not the shared experience of being ruled by the same absolutist king. Another French philosopher of the Enlightenment was Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who uh, wrote in 1762 the Social Contract, in which he advocated the uh, importance of direct democracy in, um, in representative government. Um, he's better known, however, for his development of the concept of the general will. Rousseau believed that in order to defend the strength of a democratic representative government, it was necessary for all members of society to support decisions reached through democratic vote, even if they had disagreed with that decision initially. For example, if someone had opposed going to war with another country and the rest of the population had voted to go to war against that country, then for the sake of maintaining a strong and united democracy, the person that was against the war would have to then support the war. Uh, this is a topic that uh, might seem familiar to you in the context of the Iraqi war. Jean-Jacques Rousseau believed that those that did not support the general will were betraying the cause of their country, betraying democracy, and as such should be punished. The level of punishment varied, but Rousseau was willing to accept capital punishment, in other words, death, if the person in question did not want to support the general will. These radical new ideas of the Enlightenment made their way to the larger population thanks to philosophes like Voltaire. He was a French poet and playwright. 
He specialized in writing satires against the king and the state, as well as against the church. Even though these satires were not highly intellectually developed, they did succeed in convincing the population at large of the Enlightenment philosophs' message. One of the more famous satires that Voltaire wrote was uh, a direct criticism of the king's government when it was facing a fiscal crisis in 1788. The king was known for his lavish expenditures, spending a lot of tax money on great parties that would last on for days and days. Um, when facing the fiscal crisis, however, the king had agreed with his advisors that to cut down on costs, uh, he would get rid of a number of the 100 horses that he had for personal use. Only he could ride these horses, nobody else. In response to this, Voltaire would write that rather than get rid of the horses, what the government should do was to get rid of the ass that rode them. As you might imagine, the king did not think that Voltaire's commentary was very funny. Uh, Voltaire was imprisoned almost immediately and uh, only thanks to his contacts with other royalty was he able to get out of jail. Uh, he was jailed a total of two times and uh, eventually was forced into exile outside of France. As critical as the concept of equality was to Enlightenment thinkers in their criticism of traditional authority structures, their concept of equality turned out to be less egalitarian than they themselves claimed. Enlightenment philosophers were opposed to slavery because it hampered equality among men. However, these same men were opposed to women having the right to vote or participate in politics. As it turns out, the men that so ardently supported equality among men and demanded that the oppression of men come to an end also did not consider women their equal. When they mentioned the equality of all men, they meant just men, not women. This blatant contradiction was pointed out by Mary Wollstonecraft. You see her here. She was quite possibly the first modern feminist. In her book, The Vindication of Rights of Woman, written in 1792, Mary denounced the continuance of gender inequality in the Enlightenment thinker's rhetoric, advocating for the equality between the sexes. Unfortunately, her call for equality went largely unheard, and the Enlightenment thinkers continued their struggle for equality and individual rights without including women. In the United States, slavery would be declared illegal in the 1860s. Women, on the other hand, would not receive the right to vote until the 1920s. So it, it does make one think about the uh, priorities of Enlightenment thinkers and uh, those politicians that pushed for the idea of equality among men. I'd hate to end on a negative point, but this does bring us to the end of our lecture on the birth of modernity. Um, so I will see you at the next lecture on the American Revolution.